Oh my goodness, thank you so much. That was absolutely spellbinding, Zoe. We have a few questions to kick off. Um, oh my God, that was incredible. Um, <laughs> thank you. The way the You're jokes were classified through it, the way they related to the material. Um, there's one particular facet of ketamine, which I'm interested in. Um, I had an amazing experience about a year and a half ago. <laughs> and um, I remember speaking to Zoe about it when we got a drink and being enlightened. And so I am curious on this note, if Zoe, you can talk Talk to us about an aspect of ketamine which um, a kind of special effect which didn't come up in this presentation but which I think might be quite nice to flesh out the topic with. Sure sure so here's a little anecdote so when I first came to the UK in the summer of 2000 well, I mean I'd been here before my grandparents lived in South Kensington since the 1960s but uh, when I first came here for my first summer uh, I wanted to go to Glastonbury and do like I wanted to do all the drugs and uh, a friend of mine kind of wanted to be my drugs guru uh wanted to give me everything and see what would happen like I was like this naive 21 year old Canadian he was like oh I've got a new toy somebody who's not done these things before so the first drug that he gave me was not MDMA and it was not acid it was ketamine so I was in his dorm room at UCL and I didn't know what I was doing uh you know I didn't know you're supposed to do tiny amounts so he racks up this enormous line uh and naive Canadian me Naive Canadian me looked at this huge line. I'd never put anything in my nose, by the way. I'd never put in cocaine, anything. I looked at this huge line and I said, is that going to be enough? And he's like, that'll be enough. So I do this massive line. And I was like, ow, ow, ow. Again, chlorine. I was like, Whoa, blah, blah. well, that didn't do anything. And he goes, give it a minute. And I was like, ah, da, da. so a K-hold. It's the only time in my life I've K-hold ever. Um, in the K-hole, I forgot my name. I remembered his name. I turned to him at one point and I said, have I taken drugs? And he goes like, yeah. Now in that K-hole, what happened? I had an enormous gob smacking, earth shattering orgasm that was top to bottom, head to toe, completely and totally out of this world. And no one touched me. I didn't touch myself. I was literally lying there and nothing happened. When I came out of the K-hole, I was like, did I? He's like, yeah, you did. I was like, did you? He's like, of course not. He's gay. I was like, of course not. And I said, did I? He's like, darling, you couldn't move. I was like, huh, the immaculate orgasm, an orgasm without any physical contact. Uh, turns out that's actually a very, very common ketamine response in women in particular. And in fact, actually, some of my friends who work in hospitals and pediatric units say that they have seen, because as I said, ketamine is safer to give to kids than a general anesthetic. They have witnessed uh, prepubescent and pubescent children experiencing the same thing, which is always difficult to talk about with them afterwards. But apparently the immaculate orgasm from ketamine is very much a common phenomenon. However, side note, even though it's the first thing I put in my nose and it gave me a massive, massive orgasm, I still don't like ketamine. Do they know why it happens or what what might be going on? I don't, I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. I have no idea, actually. I, I, I will ask Celia about that. But no one's I've, I've mentioned it to a bunch of scientists and no one's really explained it to me because people often when they talk about sex on drugs, they look at MDMA. But ketamine is actually very I mean, the chemsex scene, um, the big, big I mean, women do tend to get women can get involved, but it does tend to be gay men with the chem sex scene where they'll have like five day orgies with like MDMA, speed, cocaine, ketamine, GHB. Uh, they also will inject ketamine as well. They'll, it's called slamming. Uh, and I think that for some people it does have profoundly aphrodisiacal qualities, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you for a very, <laughs> I guess, fleshing out of that particular <laughs> property. Um, and um, incredibly well told story. I absolutely <laughs> loved the juxtaposition of the Covent Garden flower market and My Fair Lady with the K Fair. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's the the part of your talk that I'd like to go to next. Yeah. And um, just thinking about Eliza Doolittle and she's sitting there and she's kind of dreaming at the beginning of it, going kind of all I want is a room somewhere far away from the <laughs> of my air. And there's this very much kind of little match girl esque property to it, like the little match girl. She burns her matches and she dreams of something better than what there is and then when the matches expire she's out in the cold again um but I'm wondering um because you touched also on Adam Winstock talking about it's often traumatized women and um, 
do you think in a society where there is so much to maybe perfectly reasonably want to anesthetize ourselves to do you think that there will always be a place for a quote unquote dissociative anesthetic and do you think that actually it would ever be possible for there to be a future in which ketamine isn't in a sense needed for some of the effects that it promises you mean as an anesthetic um, as something to uh, kind of emotionally anesthetize um, one to what's going on, do you think? Do you think there's? Do you think there's ever a way to kind of move towards a, a world and a mental health climate where there's not going to be an impulse towards that experience? Oh, I think in today's economy, in today's world, you know, uh, as they say, o- often what seem like insane reactions are actually sane reactions to an insane world. Um, and in terms of numbing yourself, you know, if we were to make ketamine illegal, if we were to ban it, if we were to get rid of it, people would find something else to numb themselves. And, you know, increasingly, I am bored of talking about psychedelics, all psychedelics as miracle cures, because nothing is a miracle cure. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about SSRIs, rehab, retreats, uh, psychedelics, you know, whatever it is, whatever treatment you're talking about for an addiction or for trauma or for depression or whatever it is, if you go back to a shitty job stacking boxes for Amazon where you make minimum wage and then the richest man in the world just keeps destroying all the other industries and he wants to go to Mars, or, you know, (laughs) increasingly we live in a world where AI is being celebrated as a tool we can use to replace people in all their professions, but you need a profession to be able to eat and the cost of living is going through the roof and the gap between rich and poor is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it's boring to talk about any, any treatment for a mental health problem as a silver bullet because all of them have been sold to us as silver bullets and it's kind of a way of skirting around the real issue which is wealth inequality and the way the economy works and you know as the activist says fucking capitalism the problem isn't that we need different drugs obviously i really i'm a big fan of psychedelics obviously but we don't need different drugs we need a restructuring of society and increasingly i'm more interested in people who talk to me about taxes than i am about talking about serotonin agonists that was really really beautifully put and I mean I guess there's an implicit trough in the name peak isn't there that's a field trip as well it's kind of like this implication of a sabbatical from the life that you've got to go back to and there's something Rianne said to me recently which I'd like to try and craft a question around and then I guess this will be the last one for me and then after that we can start to think about opening up um but so there is this Tyson Young Kapoor idea that um, Western education is premised upon the domestication of horses. And so it seems very, very resonant that if we are learning how to keep ourselves quiet and keep ourselves bridled and kind of force ourselves through these systems where we become workhorses, that then a horse tranquilizer is going to be exactly what we need in which to kind of stay um, <laughs> in place. Ready to- I haven't heard that. That's brilliant. It's, it's what, I might have butchered it. It's um. <laughs> he's talking. He's talking about how how Western education, um, today is based on a Prussian indoctrination system, and that indoctrination system was based on horse domestication, which was separating the young from their parents, mothers, in in daylight hours, keeping them in a in a, in a confined space with little sort of stimulation right so sort of taking mm. them indoors and then rewards and punishments for pointless tasks mm. and um it is incredibly effective at, at crushing people's spirits and making them Sounds very like obedient school. and and very sort of nationalist wow i've not heard that before but that i can see where they're going with that for sure yeah uh, yeah and it was so effective that that was just exported to the rest of the world as an, as an education system but um, what I'm wondering is, and thank you so much for delineating it so beautifully in a way that I think goes with where what I was hoping to ask you, which is, um, why was there stigma around it being a horse tranquilizer and how and in your other writing around uh, medical topics and in your knowledge of biology why is there the sense that if a medicine is for horses it's not for humans and then how does that square with the recent hype and the divorce of ketamine from any previous notoriety in order to repackage it as the miracle cure but yeah particularly kind of why is there stigma around medicines for animals I, I don't know if 
I don't know if I agree with the question though, because I don't know if I really saw much of a stigma against it in the British press or in the British public as being a horse tranquilizer. Uh, I mean, the horse tranquilizer joke is accurate because it is used for farm animals and, and dogs as well as elephants and so forth. Uh, I think it just made for a really easy strap line like kitty smack. Um, but I don't know how much I want to blame the media. Granted, I am a member of said media, so I do get really bored when people go on and on about Mr. Media, the way they portray things. Like I used to be an environmental reporter, for example, and I would go to climate protests and talk to activists and they would say, oh, you're a member of the media. And I'm like, Dick, I make 20,000 pounds a year working my ass off to write pieces for the New Internationalist and other newspapers and magazines like, don't talk to me like I'm Rupert fucking Murdoch, like go fuck yourself, pardon my language. So I think that blaming the media is frankly, a lazy shorthand. And I see people do it all the time. You know, journalists and the media really just project back to society what is projected onto it. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk about media portrayal of things, for example, I think a really interesting contrast, you know, again, going back to the difference between North America and the UK. In the UK, there was always a lot of grumbling about the dangers of cannabis, marijuana, and the risks that it had in leading to early onset schizophrenia in young men. And when I first got to the UK in 20, 2003, lots of people talked about that and they took it as an article of faith that cannabis can lead to schizophrenia. In Canada, where I grew up, I never once heard a word about that. You know, Canada obviously being the G7 nation that was first to legalize marijuana across the country, no one ever, 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 ever talked about the risks to, of schizophrenia. In Canada, what I grew up hearing was scare stories about MDMA. There were a lot of kids who died at raves well, not a lot, but enough that it made the media lose its fucking mind and made parents lose their mind. And as you and I were talking about, Roz, very often those kids died not really because of the MDMA. They died because of dehydration and sleep deprivation and every other impact on their body. You know, taking MDMA at a rave or a festival where you haven't slept in four days is very different from taking it in a clinical setting where you're looked after. Um, but when I was a teenager in Canada, there are a number of scare stories about MDMA being super dangerous, about ecstasy pills being a, a curse and a, a threat to the youth. No one ever talks about that in the UK. So to me, that's more of a cultural difference. And as for the stigmatizing of ketamine as a horse tranquilizer, it's definitely true that not enough people realize that it's an essential medicine. And yeah, I, I mean, the way it's always being talked about as special K and a club drug ignores the medical importance of it. And again, I'm not saying we should get rid of ketamine and I'm not saying it doesn't have a time and a place and in the right time and a place, it can save your life. That is absolutely true. The problem is that we're doling it out willy nilly. That makes a lot of sense. And thank you for bringing an enormous amount of nuance to, because yes, I guess it can be very, very lazy just to blame the media. And it also, it can be very reductive rather than um, focusing on all of the different agencies and personalities and perceptions that together make up the media. And obviously that complexity is more alive the further you go into it. So from your vantage point, kind of right in the middle of this milestone, makes a lot of sense that you're able to be a lighthouse on that topic um what i'd love to do now is open up to everyone um because i know that we've got a lot of people who are very excited for this q a and to be here today um we've got someone from bristol we've got someone who's working <laughs> on addiction treatments we've got an artist so we've got so many people who are able to comment if you'd like to on different aspects of all of the amazing strands that zoe's pulled together here so yes please do fire away We've got hands up from John and Dan. I, I first heard about ketamine when I was studying with Stan Groff in the late 80s. I just wanted to run some, what we said about it was that they had used it as an anesthesia <laughs> with adults, but the doctors got unnerved hearing about out of, out of body experiences. <laughs> so they started limiting it to kids because they don't care what kids say after they come out of surgery. <laughs> have, have you ever heard that? I have. Well, I actually didn't know about Stan Groff working with it. That is fascinating. Um, yeah, as you were saying about kids, and no one gives a shit what kids say when they come out of a dis. I mean, kids are already high anyways, let's be honest. Um, yeah, friends of mine who worked in hospitals who say that they give ketamine to kids all the time, they say that the way that they writhe and behave on the table is hilarious, and the stuff that they say afterwards is hilarious. Uh, have you seen that it was a viral YouTube video called David After the Dentist? Where this little, I'm sure I mean, there's some, there must be somebody here who's oh, seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just Google, just Google David after the dentist. Go forth and enjoy. It's hilarious. 
Uh, and there's also spoof videos of like Darth Vader doing the exact same routine. That kid was clearly given ketamine. Um, yeah, people's reactions after taking drugs when they're not used to them are, can be quite funny. My grandmother, after she had bowel surgery uh, for bowel cancer, I went to go and see her in the hospital right after. And I came in, she goes, Zoe, the drugs. I'm like, uh-huh, they're so amazing. I know, no, you don't. Yeah, yeah no, I, I do, grandma. And my brother was like, should we take a breathing <laughs> now? Stan, uh, Stan did mention some things about John Lilly. So I'll confirm your, your impression. He apparently somebody was with pulled him out of a hot tub once where he was underwater drowning on, on ketamine. I think he also crashed a bike and was really badly injured riding. Oh, God. Yeah, no, I mean, I also know people who like, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have described them as friends, but I know people who broke their arms, uh, K -hold, like just bumping ketamine walking down the street and then just K-hold without even intending to and went arm first, smashed their arm. I know someone who smashed at all their front teeth. Like it is no joke, man. But at least it doesn't hurt too much when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the same cannot be true of acid. If you've ever injured yourself on acid, you will remember that magnified to a hundred for the rest of your life. Actually, I think that goes both can go both ways. Sometimes it's nothing at other times it's magnified. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much. No, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. That's really from Bristol now, um, if that's where you are, Kevin. Yeah, we have someone who might be able to comment on what it's like at, um in the ground, ketamine wise on Bristol today, if you'd like to go next. <laughs> yes, wait, I, I'm in Bristol. I am in Bristol. I'm here with a Bristolian as well. <laughs> Anyway, any, any Americans who are watching, Bristol is a magical, wonderful place. However, it is also a hotbed of ketamine use. Yeah, so my concerns are around the dangers of PR and selling it as a panacea. And I think we could probably all agree that capitalism, the modification of these things as panaceas is, is, is an extraordinary problem. Yeah. Uh, and having these non-nuanced views that, that, that there are uh, no causes for concern is really unhelpful. But similarly, though, I think maybe it's equally unhelpful to engage in a process of vilification. So when I hated Marmite, <laughs> it was about my relationship with Marmite. <laughs> and I never told other people that they couldn't get value out of Marmite. And in fact, my position's changed on Marmite. And I've, I've actually been uh, able to uh, ha have a relationship with Marmite. That's changed in my life. I'm making an analogy here, obviously. What I'm saying, I guess, is that part of the concerns around ketamine is related to the fact that it is so powerful. Mm. It's such a powerful medicine because it's deeply disassociated. It's an amazing painkiller, both emotionally and physically. And this is one of the reasons that people are having an addictive relationship with it, because understanding addiction is about the root causes of addiction and why people are drawn to these substances rather than vilifying the substances themselves as the root cause. Mm -hmm. So why I think you're right in highlighting the fact that we need to tread carefully, and we absolutely do, it's because it's such a powerful substance. Mm -hmm. I think that there needs to be some nuance around the possibility that part of the reason that it's so powerful and such concern is also drawing us to the fact that it, the place that it might have, if, if, if dealt with properly, if engaged with in the correct way. And I guess just one like closing comment on that is uh, maybe for uh, clarity, I was wondering, is it in fact the only addictive psychedelic or not a psychedelic? Because I believe both things were said. And I think well, that the, 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 the the definition of psychedelic, as I understand it, is the expansion of consciousness. And I don't think the definition of psychedelic is based on the specific uh, neurophysiological effects. And it definitely can be used for consciousness expansion. So I think, I think it is a psychedelic. That's my position on it. I think it has value as a medicine, but that we have to tread extremely careful with it. And you're absolutely right that we cannot go with the it's good all of the time, it's a panacea. And because it's so powerful, like anything that's incredibly powerful, it's a double-edged sword, like you said, right? But the, I had just have some concerns around vilifying the tool rather than the, uh, the, the relationship with it and the possible downsides of that. I guess that's my comment. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, well, first of all, I hope nobody came away from this talk with the idea that I'm vilifying ketamine. I'm not vilifying ketamine. As I said, when I had it with my wisdoms were removed, it was amazing. It's indispensable in all pharmacies. It's a very important drug. We need it. So I'm neither vilifying it nor putting it on a pedestal. As I said, every drug is a double-edged sword. Uh, is it a dissociative or is it a psychedelic? Well, then that just becomes a semantic argument about what you mean by the word. Um, yet I would say it has psychedelic qualities, but it's not a classic psychedelic. And I would use the word psychedelic classically to just define things that interact with the serotonin 2A receptor. But I'm a bit of a stickler for accuracy. I'm a bit of a stickler for accuracy and a biology nerd. So I kind of like things that biologists like to organize things, you know, like evolution and different groups of things where we get really obsessive about putting things in different boxes. So it has psychedelic qualities. It's not a classic, classic psychedelic per se. However, as to your question, is it the only addictive one? So that's a very interesting question. So uh, people can become addicted to other things that aren't necessarily technically addictive per se. So there is actually no one universal definition for addiction. Uh, so for example, I would say the only thing I'm really, even though I can be like, there are things that I've had issues with at times, the only thing I'm really addicted to is caffeine. If you try going cold turkey off at caffeine, holy fucking shit, the headache that you get from that is unlike anything, like, and nothing alleviates it, but more caffeine. Uh, I have many friends who've been addicted to heroin and that's the withdrawal from that is real. So technically some people say something's only addictive if you get withdrawal. However, you can become addictive, addicted to things that are not technically addictive. So actually one drug that a lot of people are getting quote unquote addicted to or have problematic usage with is DMT because you can get very hooked on that alternate universe. So it's not addictive in the sense that it causes withdrawal, but you can get hooked on going into that other realm and escaping the here and now and going and meeting those entities and exploring what you explore. Um, I actually have a friend who got addicted to magic mushrooms when he was, I mean, technically addicted, but not really. Uh, he took mushrooms in, during mushroom season in, in London every single day for two months. And he said that after two months, you get so used to not talking to people that you just stop entirely. So even after he stopped taking mushrooms, he barely spoke to anyone for weeks. It was terrifying for his friends and family. Like they thought he'd completely and totally lost his mind. And let's not forget, pornography can be addictive. Gambling, gambling is one of the stupidest addictions in the world and that's not chemically addictive. So as to, you know, is it the only addictive psychedelic? No, anything in the world can be addictive. And actually going back though to what you're saying about capitalism, whether we're talking about SSRIs, whether we're talking about psychedelics, whatever we're talking about, when you, when you introduce the profit incentive, people are going to minimize the risks and they're going to exaggerate the benefits. And that is true of every right. drug. There's even a subpopulation of people who get more depressed and suicidal on SSRIs. And there's a guy named David Healy at the University of Toronto, who's now at, I think it's McMaster, who talked about this 20 years ago when I was a student in Canada. And now people talk about it, but 20 years ago, no one talked about it. He was the only one talking about it and he got massively vilified by the pharmaceutical industry. So the issue I would say is capitalism as always. And that's what leads to people lying about how beneficial these drugs are. If you take away the profit incentive and it's a publicly disseminated drug without that little icing on the cake, people are a lot more honest. And also, I would also like to say another point I didn't make earlier about, I, I also, I don't like the word addict. It's a very stigmatizing word and it paints people as being dependent, as weak as, and you know what, the thing about addiction, uh, all of the friends, and I have a lot of friends who've been addicted to things, and I've been addicted to things, and all of the friends that I have who've been addicted to things, including ketamine and heroin, these are the smartest people that I know. They're usually the smartest and the most sensitive. They're usually really beautiful souls. They're often really generous. There's just a lot of pain in there, and they often basically just think and feel too much. And one of the right. biggest myths, exactly. one of, and one of the biggest myths about addiction is that people who get addicted to things are lazy or that they don't care about other people or that they're uninspired or they just want an easy way out. And in my experience, the people who've had addiction issues were anything but incredibly smart, incredibly sensitive, beautiful, beautiful souls. 
really perfect point in the conversation to bring in both Emma and Claire because we've got a question up in the chat from Emma I don't know if you'd like to ask it out loud or if you'd like me to paraphrase it but Emma is asking about addiction and then we've also got Claire with us who does incredible work um, on addiction and I'd also just like to point out before we go into this that there's an amazing point Zoe makes in her book um, which is it's one of those points where it's like god this is really obvious but what it needs <laughs> saying before you realize it but it's that we're not um we don't like the drugs in and of themselves we like the drugs because of the neuropeptides they fire off we want to feel endorphins we want to feel oxytocin we want to feel dopamine and so we like drugs that do that and it therefore obviously makes sense that we like sex we like gambling we like all of these other things that can fire off those neurotransmitters and uh, and technology all of these things that might make us feel good but also have the potential to make us feel shit so so with that kind of caboodle of elements, I'd love to get you to ask your question if you'd like to, Emma, and also bring Claire into the conversation to comment on addiction in relation to all of this as well. So, um, yeah, my question, um, any strategies or helpful insights on how to get off it, you know, like, um, oh. like you said, like exercise, like how do you replace whatever the hell it does in your brain? <laughs> If you were to like set a plan for someone and go, okay, we know this is bad. Like, like what would be in the schedule for them to do? Oh, that is such, that's a, that's a really, really, really good question. Uh, so first of all, I don't believe in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous 12 step program uh, because they're liars. They tell people that 75% of people who go through the program uh, are cured of their addiction and that the other 25% are just inherently flawed and that is not only scientifically unsound it's also fucking cruel. I know people who've gone to AA and to NA asking for help and they said that all NA did was make them feel worse. An old boyfriend of mine who was a heroin addict went to NA and he said having to put up his hand and say I am helpless was the least helpful thing because he was chemically dependent on something that when he tried to stop like if you if you drink a lot, it takes basically three days to get clean. Like heroin addiction, the withdrawal can last for three months, even more. You know, so being being told to say I'm helpless did not help. So I don't believe in the 12-step program. I also don't believe in rehab because rehab is, as they say, the expression is relapse is good for business. It's designed to be a revolving door. So if you go somewhere incredibly fancy and incredibly plush and that makes you feel better like those field trip photos that I showed you of their clinics. It's designed to make you want to come back. I was reading an interview with Matthew Perry from Friends. He went to rehab for his Vicodin and alcohol problem. How many times? 53 times. That's not a very good fucking cure, is it? So what actually cures addiction is an excellent question because in the West, we have very few answers and most of the treatments that we have are pathetic and we don't know how to deal with it. Um, this is a really difficult and really complex issue. Obviously there's different kinds of addictions. So cigarette smoking, for example, is very different to using heroin to doing ketamine. So you need to look at the reasons why somebody is doing something. Um, I would, you know, like I've got a lot of friends, I mean, I'm a journalist, right? So I have a lot of friends who've been Coke and, and booze addicts, right? But in my experience, the ones who got addicted to booze and Coke, they tended to be very, very active and had really high pressure jobs and were doing lots of stuff all the time. They were just using that to deal with the stress. Ketamine addiction to me is also very sad because ketamine addicts tend to become very comfortable with doing nothing with their lives. And I watched a lot of the smartest people that I know just waste years living in squats in Bristol and Brighton doing absolutely nothing. And a dissociative, which takes you outside of yourself, makes you even more comfortable with doing nothing. As to what makes somebody better, it's a really, really difficult question to answer, and it depends on the person. Sometimes it is a wake-up call, like, for example, one of my friends is dead. She did way too much ketamine, and I mean like nine grams a day too much, for years and years and years and years. And then it was New Year's Eve, and she was given a tiny amount of LSD, and she went through a door in her mind, and she never came back. And all you have to do is to see somebody go completely insane just once to know that psychedelics can be dangerous. That friend didn't die from ketamine per se. She died from suicide a couple of years later. She stabbed herself in the heart dead sober on Christmas day after having an argument with her mother who was mad at her for continuing to take drugs and drink. So what will cure an addiction is a really difficult question and I don't have an easy answer. I think that one thing that's interesting to look at is addiction transfer. So for example, a lot of the friends that I have who were heroin addicts, 
what they then found salvation in when they got clean was exercise and they became absolutely obsessed with fitness and their muscular tone and so forth to get that same hit of endorphin, right? Um, if you want to look into the history of addiction transfer, when people become addicted to something different, a fascinating field is to look at gastric bypass. So people who've been addicted to food and food addiction really is a real thing. Like if you look at rats who are given high fructose corn syrup, which is evil, if they're given high potency sugar, it lights up the same parts of their brain as crack and cocaine. It really is a drug. And if you look at children and the way they jones for sugar, you tell me that's not a drug. So people who've had gastric bypass to deal with it, there is a number of fascinating cases of people who had gastric bypass to stop them physically being able to eat as much as they wanted to before, but who then started to have really strange addictions in other ways, gambling, porn, all kinds of drugs, heroin, smack, all kinds of weird shit. So as to what, as to what is gonna get somebody out of a ketamine addiction, I would say the friends of mine who got better, all of them, needed something more to aspire to, whether it was parenthood, whether it was a career, they needed something that they cared about more. Um, but again, I don't know what the easy answers are. I mean, addiction just killed my mother. My mother died of lung cancer because she started smoking at the age of 10, 10. So, and you know, she only stopped smoking when she was diagnosed with cancer, but by then it was too late. So I don't know what's gonna help your friends in particular, but I would say with respect to ketamine specifically, you have to want something else more, whether it's a romantic partner, the capacity to write a book, whatever it is, there's something else that has to matter more. And, you know, again, addiction is a very lazy term. And a lot of people who are self-medicating, it's just about trauma. It's not really about the, the drug per se. It's about what, you know, as I said, girls sexually abused as kids, kids growing up in households with no love. So. Yeah, I know that, um... Uh, when I gave uh, a whole bunch of like drinking drugs up like years and years and years ago, um, a really long time ago, and I went kind of totally clear for like eight years. And my replacement was um, Buddhist meditation um, mm -hmm. and that's just like mindfulness. And, and that, yeah, that kind of like takes, yeah, it, it gets to the root cause of what you need to do um, yeah. to, yeah, and yeah so i don't know but and also achievement like needing something to achieve isn't it you're right because they just kind of like waste around doing nothing mm -hmm. and it's yeah. like what are you doing where are you going like what are you achieving and when you have something that you're passionate about and then th there's like you know something chemical about that like you achieve something in a day and you get like a hit of I, I don't know dopamine or whatever and so there's something chemical in kind of achieving stuff i guess yeah, I mean, I certainly can speak from my experience. I mean, I'm, you know, a, a massive A type high achiever. And I was a very, I was the youngest journalist at the biggest, uh, so the youngest columnist at the biggest newspaper in Canada when I was 25 and went right out of university and doing a lot of stuff. And then in 2009, the newspaper industry went down the toilet. And in the space of a month, I lost my column, 10 of the 15 magazines that I was writing for went bankrupt. And for the very first time in my entire life at the age of 27, I was like, what the fuck do I do with my life now? I've spent my entire life working up to this point. I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And now there's no work in my industry. And that was the very first time I'd say I'd really found myself drinking too much because I was just so hopeless. But not everybody is, you know, super ambitious. Not everybody really wants to have a career. Some people just want to have babies, whatever it is you want to do. But it really depends on the person. So the, I would say, actually, it depends. You have to really drill into like, why, what, it, why are they addicted? What is the pain you're trying to fix? Mm-hmm. And that, and that and that goes and that goes for food too. I know people who have food addictions who very much are just filling an emotional hole. Um, so my name is Claire Wilkins. I'm the director of Pangea, which is an integrative uh, clinic that uses ibogaine as well as functional and integrative medicine to treat various dependencies, from antidepressants to fentanyl to ketamine, benzodiazepines, uh, you know, all sorts of. Uh, behavioral dependencies and, and habituations as well. And we've been working with ketamine for a long time. Um, I happen to have tried it once with an eminent uh, chemist in, you know, a very clean and wonderfully, you know, prepared way. And so I have my own personal experience one time and I said, I would never do it again. I got the message from, ah. from my experience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the chemist with whom I was doing the, the, the medicine 
and after I came out of the experience and my mouth stopped being so numb and all of that, and I felt myself coming back into my body, said, so do you want to go again? And I just, you know, I used to be an intravenous heroin user and a methadone patient before I found Ibogaine and Ibogaine completely transformed my life. And I've been working with Ibogaine for 18 years. And I'm also a board member of Gita, which is the nonprofit for Ibogaine therapy. And we do a lot of, I do a lot of, of consulting uh, with different people who work with in the in the field of addiction and dependencies. And um, with ketamine, what is really interesting to me is that I don't think it was mentioned, but it binds and has affinity for the mu and the kappa opioid receptors. If it does. So this is something really important to note. This is, you know, and I remember when I first, at the very beginning of, you know, my entry into working with psychedelics, seeing ketamine on the list of all this poster and ketamine was there. And I was like, why is ketamine? It's this synthetic, it's, it's an anesthetic. It's like, it didn't register for me yeah. until I finally took it. And I, I mean, I took other people's word for what they said, but until I finally took it and had a very, I had a vi visual experience. I had an out-of-body experience. I got messages. I received messages that were, didn't seem from my own brain. You know what I mean? And, um, and I got clear, I, I it was very clear and I also formed a giant pimple on my breast afterwards. And it was just the most awful synthetic, creepy feeling, but there is a, a benefit. And for anybody, I'm firmly of the belief that how we want to treat our bodies is our right and, 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 and nobody else's business. It's our, you know, uh, fundamental right to numb ourselves, how we want to numb ourselves, to please ourselves, how we want to please ourselves. And that it is a societal issue, as Zoe was saying, you know, that a lot of the people that we have worked with that became dependent on ketamine are professionals, physicians, scientists, psychedelic pioneers. A lot of people talk about the spirit of ketamine and how they feel connected to, and I believe there was a gentleman earlier talking about, or someone brought up the question of how people feel connected to God. They feel that they have spiritual awakenings with ketamine. And then what occurs is it is, you know, dependency inducing, it's binding to, it's, it releases dopamine really quickly in the same way that cocaine does and various other, you know, nicotine administrative, you know, uh, substances do. And so with Ibogaine, as it upregulates dopamine and it interrupts, we, we have been able to uh, take care of quite a few ketamine dependent patients over, you know, the last couple of decades. And um, just in the same way that Ibogaine works for opiates so well, you know, yeah. it interrupts the dependency. And it was, with ketamine, there's not as much of withdrawal symptoms that are physical. There are, you know, of course, there's the renal fa failure, there's, um, you know, anxiety, there's tachycardia, there's sweating, but there's an intense craving. That's the largest withdrawal symptom. It's like with cocaine, there's not really a whole lot, like there's depression with cocaine, you know, it's not like the physical, physiological symptoms, the physical symptoms that opioids have. And um, with ketamine, it's this intense craving, 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 craving. Yeah. There's, this, there's a psychopharmacological aspect to ketamine that's very pronounced. You know, there's this some neurochemistry that really needs to be attended to. So Emma, when you were asking about it, you know, it's like telling people to, to go and exercise or find something that is a replacement therapy is very difficult for people with ketamine because they really feel like they've reached like God level. You know, I mean, John Lilly is an extreme example. Uh, yes. But then I've seen it with tons of our clients, you know, they feel like they've reached this ascendant level and they need to keep going back there and they need to keep uh -huh. going back there. Yes. And they're so numbed out, they don't see how ridiculous that it, that, that it, that it seems to other people. It's like, you, just like an evangelical church yeah. leader speaks in tongues and, you know, says that they can take you to heaven or whatever. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's often like that. And then people on ketamine speak gobbledygook and things like that, you know, the glossolalia and things. So yeah. That's my answer is just that, you know, and I'm not saying that Ibogaine is the exclusive solution for ketamine, but I just wanted to bring up, you know, the fact that it has affinity for opioid receptors yeah, yeah. and also, you know, its effect on, you know, um, one's spirit that it, 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 it somehow 
connects people to allows people to think that they are connected to this divine source. This is something that I see over and over again. It's not just party people. These are professionals. These are scientists. These are physicians. These are yeah, soccer yeah. moms. And now with the, the mail order nasal sprays and the anal creams, I recently worked with a soccer anal mom, cream. you know, and she was putting anal cream, ketamine anal cream on herself three times a day. And when we spoke, she, you know, she goes, oh my God. And she had been clean and sober, quote unquote. She had been a former uh, opioid user 10 yeah. years before. And we had treated her for Ibogaine. She'd become a mom and a business owner and all this stuff. And she had had a bit of depression and the doctor prescribed her ketamine and she was putting the cream on and then she couldn't stop. She just yeah, couldn't yeah. stop because it's very dependency inducing. And we did an Ibogaine treatment with her, you know, and it was yeah. re relatively quick and she was over it, you know, uh, very, very rapidly. She had the experience of having Ibogaine before. Um, in terms of finding other things, I, I'm a huge believer in whatever floats your boat, you know, right. whatever you can do that serves you. And, you know, it's like addiction, you know, there's sometimes defined as what we do that hurts us and we keep doing it, even though we know it hurts us and the people around us, you know what I mean? And then there's dependency. It's like, for example, with benzodiazepines, when you were stressed out, Zoe, you were, you had a dependency, you know, you, because you couldn't sleep. And then there's addiction where it becomes like, you're out of control. You're selling your cars. You're, you know, you're, you're getting brain, you know, benzo brain and memory loss, and you're getting these, you know, adverse, you know, secondary effects and things like that. And so I don't know. I think that there certainly is a place for ketamine. Like there is, I I'm, you know, a huge promoter of the legalization of all drugs and um, and the decriminalization of drugs. And we, we've seen what's happened in Portugal and things like that. So, yeah, yeah um, that's my answer to you, Emma, is that I can just give you my experience, you know, yeah. with 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 ketamine. And um, but it's 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 I've had friends that I've lost to and, and, and people that I know that just go to another land. As, as Zoe was saying, they just, you know, disappear and then it, it, people even die, fall, jump out of windows and get brain injuries and things like that. So I, I really uh, empathize with you that two close people, very close to you are in this situation because it's, they're, they're anesthetized to you, to society, to life. Yeah, and so you're, you've already kind of feel like you've lost them. And so being able to penetrate to them and say, you know, there are solutions and, you know, do, but the other question is, do they want to stop? Some people really just want to keep using heroin. No. Some people just no. really want to keep drinking or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? so the, yeah, yeah. So first of all, Claire, very nice to meet you. I've seen your name before many times. Uh, so if you want to talk about Ibogaine. Uh, so I spent two years writing that piece for Rolling Stone magazine. I have been researching Ibogaine for the most pathetic, ridiculous amount of time. It's, as you know, once you start to learn about Ibogaine, you go down the rabbit hole and you realize <laughs> how un oh, it's beautiful. It's just the most fascinating, beautiful, interesting, intricate, and important drug. Uh, so those who are, I'm sure everybody watching this knows what Ibogaine is, but it's widely used in the Caribbean as a treatment for opioid dependence and addiction, but it's also known as a universal addiction disruptor. So it will work with ketamine addiction, but it will also work with smoking. It will work with caffeine or work with drinking. It will the most important thing that it does with heroin addiction is that it gets rid of withdrawal. And anybody who's been addicted to heroin will tell you that the withdrawal is the biggest thing to getting clean. So in fact, some of my friends who used to be heroin addicts, heroin addiction, once you get over it, you don't tend to want to go back because the withdrawal is so painful. Uh, a friend of mine had to get clean off of heroin in Amsterdam in the 1980s. He'd been, an, he'd been a heroin user and a heroin dealer for years. Then he got arrested and then he had to go cold turkey in prison and it took him three months three months can you imagine barfing and shitting and your fever going up and down and not even sleeping for three straight months interestingly this friend of mine does not believe in ibogaine therapy and the reason he doesn't believe in it because he loved heroin so much he said if he could have done ibogaine to get clean in two days he would have just gone right back to using and there is in fact a a, a small but significant population of heroin users who do not feel that they have a problem. They're very happy to continue taking heroin, 
And what they do is they periodically use ibogaine as a way to reset their tolerance so they can carry on merry well, <laughs> merrily. Uh, you know, and I have to say, I did actually endorse ibogaine therapy for a family friend uh, who was desperate to get her son off a of smack. And she and her husband spent 8,000 pounds sending him to a clinic in the Caribbean. He wasn't ready. He didn't really want to get clean. And he didn't have anything in the UK to come back to in terms of employment or romance or anything. So when he came back to the UK, he just went right back to using. Uh, and I feel very guilty that they wasted 8,000 pounds on my recommendation. So I don't know, again, going back to what cures an addiction, I don't know what the answer is. However, I do know that it, the ultimate, I mean, you know, smoking isn't the same thing as drinking too much because you're in pain. Like smoking is just a chemical dependence on something that's like a lubricant for your daily existence. But a lot of people who use K to go into a K hole, heroin to, you know, zone out alcoholics to just get bastard drunk, you're escaping something. And the issue is, what are you escaping? And the usual answer is an enormous amount of pain that nothing else seems to fix. Right. And what is there a cure for? I mean, there are very few cures for anything on this planet, right? And we're uh, talking, uh, you know, like, what, mean, what, are, what, are, what are the cures? You know, I mean, there. Oh, well, I know, mean, there's, I mean, antibiotics will cure your cure you of a very simple some infections, right? But something that's so, it, that isn't just, an individualized uh, condition, something that, yeah. as you're saying, is systemic, yeah, and part of society, and part of how we interact, and has a lot to do with how we connect with each other, and has a lot to do with trauma, perhaps as well, epigenetics, um, availability, you know, things like that. I mean, yeah. cure yeah. seems to be a word that just doesn't even fit in that into that, you know, like you know, multitude of 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 attributes that contribute to dependencies and addiction yeah I mean I would say that western medicine and I was raised by a hippie mom who loved all kinds of hippie bullshit like homeopathy like you know I, I mean I didn't try paracetamol until I was 19 years old uh, I would say that western medicine is very very good at diagnosing treating and curing things that are entirely physical in their manifestation or their presentation or their cause so this broken leg I was walking again three weeks later magic the morphine that i got in the recovery unit after surgery magic i picked up a parasite when i was in new orleans in 2016 took a pharmaceutical drug a few months later and it got rid of it in three days it's very simple physical problems western medicine is brilliant at but when it comes to anything involving the mind and the mind body relationship between like you know when i have traumatic memories come back or as i said after that house fire i didn't sleep for seven days in a row Right. You would think that your body would go, I need to sleep. That's a smart solution. But your brain is going, I'm completely and totally freaked out. I'm terrified of everything. and I can't sleep. Anything involving the brain and addiction is certainly one of those things. Western medicine is really bad at treating, you know, and whenever I shit on Alcoholics Anonymous and I will for a thousand years, there's a book called The Sober Truth that everybody should read. And once you read it, you can't unread it. You know, it's taken as an article of faith in America that it works. Why is it taken as an article of faith in America that it works? Well, two reasons. Number one, America is a country founded on religious principles, right? So they've got, in God we trust on their money. I always remind people, America is where all the religious freaks went in the, in the 1700s, the people for whom Europe wasn't religious enough. The people who saw the 30 years war, the people who saw the witch burnings and went, oh, ye of little faith, we're going to go beyond the ocean to found the Holy Land. You know, so AA is founded on religious principles and on faith, and Americans love that shit. They also love it because it doesn't cost them anything. So if you go to your doctor needing help, they can just send you to AA, which doesn't cost the government any money. In the UK, they don't send people to 12 steps. They send them for things like CBT, for which there is evidence. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there was a question in what you were saying, but certainly um, I am with you on the Ibogaine train. I think it's the most fascinating, incredible, and important drug. And when I first discovered it in 2015, I mean, I haven't done it, I'd like to, but the number of people I've met, met since who would be dead without it, absolutely a wonder drug. But as I said, it's not going to cure you unless you're ready, unless you wanna get clean. And lots of people don't wanna get clean. They're very, they enjoy their addictions and they're not ashamed. And depending on the addiction, that's okay. I mean, a romantic love, as I said, can be an addiction. 
one thing I was thinking about, you touched, Claire, on um, the f- fact that it would be better if, well, I say fact because I agree completely, this is coming from three years working in drug policy, it'd be better to legalise it all. Um, there's no substance that I think would be more, that would be less dangerous if it was brought into a legal regulation context. Um, cynically, but realistically, I think that ketamine is being offered to the extent that it is partly because of where it sits in the scheduling. So in the UK, it's Schedule 2 rather than Schedule 1. So people are delightedly alighting on this idea that we can provide it in clinics. And that is because doctors already have the ability to prescribe it um, in certain contexts with MRHA recommendation and then off-label for whatever they want. So... Um, It occurs to me that these policy permissions, um, which are not coming into focus in a lot of the media coverage, are a really big part of why we're seeing this rash of clinics springing up. Um, And what I would love to ask you, Zoe, is whether you think that there's any danger of what looks set to happen with ketamine, um, marring efforts to get towards decriminalization of all substances overall, putting the rest of psychedelic research and rescheduling into jeopardy. Like what are the risks there of everything capsizing because of ketamine being the substance to rock the boat? Yeah, um, the psychedelic renaissance is always very fragile. Um, You know, it's something that we've been waiting half a century for. Uh, And my favorite period of psychedelic experimentation is not the 60s with the counterculture and the hippies. It's the 1950s when it was in the hands of psychiatrists who did all manner of really inspiring and really beautiful work with it, such as all the uh, experiments being done in Saskatchewan, Canada with alcoholics at Weyburn Mental Hospital by Humphrey Osmond. That, That history is beautiful and really inspiring. And we don't want another backlash and everybody's terrified of another backlash. This is what I see as the most likely scenario. I see this happening. Imagine you are a married couple with a really beautiful, really brilliant teenager who's like 18 years old, straight A student, athlete, but is incredibly depressed. And you read about ketamine therapy because the CN- the New York Times is writing about it. CNN is writing about it. You see all these effusive headlines. You've never even heard of it. You think, well, maybe this is a silver bullet. You send your kid for ketamine therapy. The kid seems to get a bit better then they get worse again. Maybe you send them back again for ketamine therapy. If you've got a smart kid, it's not going to take them very long if they're a digital native to figure out how to get ketamine off the dark web. That then leads to problematic use and addiction. And it's only a matter of time before people start dying, whether they die dr- drowning in the bath, whether they dry, whether they die in a car accident. Uh, there's a, a lot of different ways that ketamine can kill you. Even if it doesn't make you have an overdose, it can cause an incredible amount of damage. So all it's going to take is one dead kid. If we've got one dead, beautiful, smart, white kid, it's America, got one dead kid. And say that kid had a lawyer for a dad and a doctor for a mom, and they're educated and they're wealthy, and they are out for blood. That's all it's going to take is one dead kid to become the poster child for how psychedelics can kill you. And I'm not saying if that happens, I'm saying when that happens. The risk is that everyone's going to think of every other psychedelic in the same way that they think of ketamine.